Good morning. Good morning. All right. I just wanted to make sure everybody's awake. You're going to have lots of good speakers today. Um, so before I tell you about me, I'm going to tell you about the other speakers. We all got together for dinner last night, and uh, there were some broken glasses, and there was a, it, it was a little bit of a rowdy crowd. But I have to tell you, the thing that impressed me most about all the speakers who are here today is they're all passionate about what they're doing. Really passionate about what they're doing. They're all involved in startups in very different ways. And I consider that a key attribute of being a successful entrepreneur. Think about that. It's really, really important for you to be passionate about what you're doing. So, I'm John Barham with Threshold Ventures. Um, I'm a recovering venture capitalist. What is a recovering venture capitalist? So it means I used to invest and I dropped out of investing. So if you want money from me, you're not gonna get it. But you're gonna get something far more valuable. You're gonna get help, advice, guidance, contacts, relationships, those things actually turn out to be far more valuable than money. And that's actually the reason I dropped out. There was way too much money floating around and people came to me looking for money when they, what they really needed was help. So today I'm gonna to help you in a, little, in a small way. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of this, the um, best practices of Silicon Valley. No, we're not asking for all of you to move to Silicon Valley. Uh, you don't have to. But there are certain things you can learn about how business is done in Silicon Valley, how uh, startups are successful, and those are the things that I want you to take away and incorporate as they apply to your businesses. So entrepreneurs, they are risk takers. So if you go to your parents, you say, I'm, I'm gonna become an entrepreneur, I'm gonna be in a startup, and your parents say, well, that's very risky. Don't say, no, it's not risky. It's risky. But you're going to be very careful about the risks you take. And notice the person who's on that tightrope is, and that's awfully high up in the air, they have a tightrope, okay? They're not trying to fly by themselves. That would be risky, really risky. Um, if anybody does skydiving, you know, jumping from airplanes, most skydivers I know actually have parachutes. Okay. So when you think about starting a company, you can take risks, but you want to take careful, calculated risks. That's what being in a startup is all about. One of the things that we do really well in Silicon Valley is when somebody has an idea for a startup, instead of not telling anybody about it, we tell everybody about it. We socialize the idea. And guess what? When we do that, the ideas get better. And of course, the question that people always ask me is, well, if I socialize the idea, somebody's gonna steal it from me. Well, if all you have is an idea, then perhaps you don't have very much. And in fact, socializing the idea helps you make the idea better. It helps you find co-founders, brings in other people who can help you be successful. And it's a key attribute, as to, uh, one of the key reasons why Silicon Valley is successful. And as I said earlier, if all you have is the idea, then you may not have enough to start your business because at the end of the day, it's the execution on the idea that's what really matters. And yes, there are people who start businesses who start off with just an idea. We heard about that earlier today. But the only way you build traction is by executing on that idea. And that's frankly the hard part. And hopefully all of you are working on that as we speak. So when you get your idea, you're going to hear lots of people tell you everything that's wrong with your idea. And you know what? It's okay to have that kind of feedback. And you should listen to it, consider it, and in a large number of cases, ignore it. 
Now, there is some feedback that you should take and you should consider, but you typically, when you're starting a business, you're doing something that nobody else has done before. And as a result, you're going to break with conventional wisdom, and that's a good thing. But you should find people who are going to be supportive of your idea, but you should also find people who are going to raise those questions. And part of your job is to listen to those questions, think about them, and either prove those people right or prove them wrong. And that's one of the things I say to startups. I meet with hundreds of startups. I work all over the world. Um, and I never tell a startup that I'm right and they're wrong. What I do is I raise questions and issues, and it's their job to figure out what the right answer is. Diversity helps your team. And I'm talking about diversity in the full range of diversity. Bring in people who look different than you, who think differently than you, who have different backgrounds and experiences, because by doing that, you will build a better team and a more successful company. One of the reasons I love working with startups all over the world is their experience, their, their, the, the things that they know are different than the companies I see in Silicon Valley. And that's a real strength. How many of you have ever tried to boil the ocean? Probably not very many of you, literally. But I guess as a lot of you have tried to boil the ocean figuratively. You've tried to do everything. And you can't. And while it's great to think you can do everything, you've got to look and say, what is it that I can realistically do? And trust me, you'll never have enough time, enough energy, or enough money to boil the ocean, no matter what the payoff is on doing so. We see startup companies all the time who spend years developing the perfect product. Perfect product. They look at every single aspect of that product and they make it perfect. And then they finally bring it to market and guess what? They discover that nobody cares. Nobody wants it. It doesn't meet the needs of the market. And so one of the things we encourage companies to do is build the minimum product you can, get it out there, get some market validation, find out if anybody cares about your product. Get that feedback, listen to it, build a better product. But get out there early. Don't be like the, the person who spends two years building the product just to discover that nobody needs it or there's already a product on the market that already solves that problem in a similar or in a different manner. We encourage companies to be global from day one. Now, what does that mean? Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. We see companies who say, oh, global from day one means that I need to sell in every single market, my website needs to be in every language, and uh, somebody in this room probably knows how many languages there are, but there are a lot. That's not what I'm talking about. However, it does mean when you build your website, make sure you make it easy when you're ready to be global to be able to have that uh, website in multiple languages. Make sure when you thought about payments or other parts of your business that you thought about accepting other currencies. That's what we mean by being global from day one. It's not necessarily doing all those things initially. Because again, you can't do that as a startup company. But you need to think about it globally. You need to understand not only the market in your home country, in your region of the world, but your, the market opportunities and long term, how are you going to address those market opportunities in other parts of the world? I was in Korea last week, two weeks ago, and Eric Schmidt said, Eric Schmidt from Google said, failure is the badge of learning. Failure is the badge of learning. You will fail. You may fail multiple times. It may be because you've built the wrong product. It may be because your company itself fails. Do not look at that as you know, you've got to change your name, you've got to move to a different country. 
What you need to do is say, that's part of the process. And guess what? It happens a lot in Silicon Valley. It will happen to a number of you. And don't prolong the failure. If it's not working, change the product, give up and start over again. Do what you need to do, but you know, keep moving. I know you, you've read all the newspapers, all the blogs, all the reports that when a company in Silicon Valley starts out, everything goes perfectly. Right? It's that chart on the left. The company starts, it grows, everything goes perfectly well. And I'm going to tell you the truth, which is it doesn't happen that way. And I don't care what company you're talking about, every major company, every small company has one or more times when it just didn't work. Let me give you an example. Facebook, they did a public offering. Well, let's go back before they did the public offering. They sold stock to a lot of very wealthy people at $48 a share. Company went public at, uh, somebody remind me, $35 a share, something like that, and promptly dropped to $22 a share. And then it went down to something like $18 a share. This was not good. This is what happens all the time. We have this amazing ability to forget all those terrible things that happen to little companies and big companies. And if you want it to look like, the trajectory of your company to look like the chart on the left, don't, don't be involved in a startup. It's not going to happen. It's the chart on the right, that's the reality. And frankly, one of the reasons venture investors spend so much time on looking at the quality of the management team is because when things don't go right, it's the caliber of the management team that makes all the difference in the world. And you need to be prepared for those kinds of things to go wrong. You have to pers persevere. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a lot of hard work. You've heard several people already talk about that earlier today. You've already heard about becoming an effective networker. Not only a networker here, but around the world. You need to build your contacts, your relationships. Just reaching out to people on LinkedIn, frankly, is not a good idea. But building those relationships, um, spending time in the EU, in Silicon Valley, wherever you're going to do business, and not only start building the networks, but you need to maintain those networks. That takes a lot of work, but you can do it. You need to become a great presenter. Everybody knows Steve Jobs for a lot of things, some good, some bad. But one of the great things about Steve Jobs was he was a very effective presenter. He told short, effective stories. And that's what you all need to learn to do. You need to use less words, not more. And it's really, really hard to do but you can do it. And when you are successful, and I don't know if we have 5,000 people in this room, but we probably have at least a couple of thousand. And my guess is, out of this room, there are gonna be a couple of people who are gonna be really knock out of the, the ballpark successes. When you are successful, help the people behind you. Help the people who are just starting out. It's a tradition we have in Silicon Valley, and we hope that that extends around the world. It's one of the reasons you see so many people here today from Silicon Valley. They're here because they want to help, and you'll have a turn to do that as well. And if you're going to be in a startup, enjoy the journey. It is a lot of hard work. As I said earlier, all the presenters here today, they are passionate about what they're doing. And it's critical that you be passionate about what you're doing as well. However, that's not to say you aren't going to have some things that get in the way. And one of the biggest things that we find that people that get in the way of that beautiful road is something called raising capital. So I'm going to tell you a brief story about my learning to drive. So many years ago, I learned to drive, and I got my uh, driver's license, and I went out on the road. And um, 
One day I'm driving and um, a car comes out and I can't stop in time and I smash up the car. And of course it was my father's car and th this was not good by the way. This was not good. I called my dad. The first thing he said, are you okay? I said, I'm okay. Then he said, so how's the car? I said, not so good. Uh, he said, it's okay. He said, what happened? I said, well, you know, I was driving and all of a sudden this car didn't stop and came out and, you know, I hit the car. Well, that worked fine until, you know, um, uh, 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 one day I was driving and there was this brick wall and I hit the brick wall. And of course I called my father and I explained to him that I'd been in a car accident and he said, what happened? And I told him a brick wall came out in the middle of the road. He didn't believe me. Okay. But, and it really didn't. But for your startup, you're going to have brick walls show up all the time. And the thing that you don't want to do is slow down or stop, particularly when you're raising capital, because raising money takes a long time. In Silicon Valley, it can take between three months and a year and a half. And we don't want you to be like me and hit that brick wall. So I'm going to briefly take you through a couple of things that you should do to avoid that brick wall and be more successful in raising capital. And there are three basic things you're going to do. You're going to do things before you raise capital, you're going to do things while you're raising capital, and you're going to do things after you raise capital. And if you follow these things, this is like a recipe, this is like making a cake, you can all do it. If you follow those things, you are more likely to be successful in raising capital and you're more likely to be successful with your company. So let's take, take it one at a time. The first thing is before, this, these are things you're going to do beforehand, is focus. Focus on the business. Focus on the market. Focus on building value. Focus, focus, focus. If everybody is your customer, no one is your customer. You need to clearly identify who you're selling to, who's buying, and what. Focus is the single most challenging thing that startups face. And it's not only focusing, but focusing on the right customer, the right market. And we spend an awful lot of time with companies helping them to focus. You need to make sure you've built a great extended team. Notice the word extended. So what does that mean? Well, you, your core team is the core team of the company. And by the way, make sure it's the right team for the company at its stage of development. So if you don't have a product to sell, and you're not going to have a product to sell for two years, do not hire a VP of sales. Okay? Do I need to say that again? Because one of you out there has got a VP of sales and you're two years away from having product to sell. Okay? Hire, make sure you have the right team for the stage of development that you're at. Secondly, it's not only the people who work as employees in the company, it's the extended team. It's advisors, mentors, board members, People who are going to broaden your base of contacts, who are going to help you in every aspect of your business. One of the key members of a team in Silicon Valley is your lawyer. Your lawyer? Lawyers in Silicon Valley do lots more than just do legal work. They are great connectors, connectors for companies to people, to money, to a lot of things that companies need other than simply doing legal work. And one of the things that I always encourage people to do, and by the way, I'm not a lawyer, I, I don't own a law firm, and this is not a paid advertisement, is hire the best attorney you can't afford because you can't afford them. 
in Silic if you come to the US, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but if you come to the US, there are lawyers who will do work for you, they will defer it, their comp their their um, their payments until you raise capital. There are all sorts of things that you can do to get the legal help you really need, and they will be incredibly valuable to you. Don Valentine. Anybody know who Don Valentine is? Well, there's some people here who know Don Valentine, because all the speakers are over here. And by the way, they, they have cards up. They're, they're rating me on how well I do, you know. So I'm, I'm, I'm very nervous. Um, uh, I'm hoping they give me a high rating. Don Valentine invests in little companies like Apple, and Cisco, uh, a couple of others. And Don Valentine is famous for saying, for saying, too early, too early, too early, too early, just right, too late. And for each one of you, you need to think. Now, most of you have already started businesses. If you haven't, you should ask that question before you start your company. But for the ones who have already started your business, you need to be asking and answering that critical question. Why? Because I see too many companies who try and staff up, who try and raise money, who try and get to market when the market isn't yet ready. And if you do that, you're going to be too early, you're going to run out of money, and you're going to fail. So if you're early, keep your burn rate down, be careful about your staffing, be careful when you take money, but think about the timing. Timing matters. And in some ways, don't worry about being too late. You've all heard of Google. Google was not the first search engine. Actually, I think they were search engine number seven or eight. Um, but they were better, not only in terms of the product, but they also had a better business model. And they became very successful. So, you know, being the first company may not be the best strategy for you. If you're going to raise money, get some market validation before you do it. You know, getting paying customers is good, getting revenue is good, but certainly making sure there are people who say, um, if you build it, I will buy it. And all too often, companies aren't doing that. Really, really important. Again, that'll help you build a better product. It'll help you better understand the market opportunity. It'll help you build a successful business, which is what I want all of you to go out and be doing. Lever well, my favorite word is money. Okay, it's the truth. I was a venture capitalist. My favorite word is money. But my next favorite word is leverage. I love that word. And often I'm speaking in rooms that have very large conference tables in front of them. This, this room doesn't, so I, I can't point to the conference table. And usually there are people seated around the conference table. And the question I raise is, so how many people does it take to lift that table up in the air? And people look at it, and if there are a lot of engineers in the room, they, you know, try and calculate the mass of the um, marble or wood and, you know, try and figure out how much weight and then do a calculation on how much weight somebody can... Anyway, we get all sorts of numbers as to how many people will take and people will say five people, ten people, somebody says twenty people, and then there's somebody who says only one person. And of course, the answer is, and I've given you the answer already, right? it's leverage, okay? Take a rock, take a stick, and get leverage. Really easy concept. Easy concept to, to understand, but a hard concept to apply to your business. And I will tell you, I've never seen a startup company that couldn't find one or more points of leverage. And that's part of your job as a founder of a CEO, figure out where those points of leverage are. They exist. They exist in every single business. Because you will never have those 20 people. You will never have enough time, energy, or money 
to be able to round up those 20 people. You need to figure out how to get leverage and do it with one person and a rock and a stick. And those exist, as I said, in every single business. Okay, so those are the things you need to do before you start raising money. That's a long list of things to do. But you know what? If you do those, you're going to be better prepared to raise capital. And I see too many companies who say, oh, you know, I woke up this morning and I'm going to raise money. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Do your homework, get prepared. It really will make a huge difference in terms of how much time it takes and, and how long it takes, uh, how, how long it takes and how much energy you have to put in to, to raising capital. So while you're raising capital, guess what? It is a full-time job. Now, full-time means full-time in addition to the other three jobs you have as running a company. So, you know, running a company, you're the chief, um, you're the chief executive officer, you get to worry about a little bit of everything, you're chief salesperson, you're chief product person. So if you're raising capital, you've got another full-time job ahead of you and recognize that it's a full-time job and part of your challenge is, so how do I keep everything going? Having been a venture capitalist for a lot of years, people often say to me, um, I'm looking to raise capital, would you introduce me to a venture capitalist? As though they are some sort of endangered species in, in a zoo. Um, and there are some VCs floating among you, so you, you guys are not endangered species, you do not belong in a zoo, don't take it personally. Um, but venture capitalists come in all sorts of varieties. And they vary by the kind of investments they do, the stage of development of the company, the kinds of technologies they do, whether they will do investments in international companies. And by the way, for a lot of US venture capitalists, they cannot, cannot invest in non-US based companies. Now there are ways to do that if you ultimately decide to come to the US. But if you plan to come to the US, raise money and go back home, and never set foot in the US again, you're gonna have a tough time because most VCs can't do that. But finding the right investor actually takes a lot of work. There are a lot of resources out there to help you do that. Um, but it's still gonna take a lot of time and a lot of energy. And there are things like um, um, link, um, 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 TechCrunch and Link Silicon Valley and a bunch of resources that if you decide to raise money, particularly in the US, can be extremely helpful to you in that process. You need to also figure out how you build momentum in your business. How do you keep things going? As an investor, I would rather invest in a company that's adding 5,000 customers a week rather than 5,000 customers a year. How do you do that? It takes a lot of work. And you have to be thoughtful about how you're building your business, how you create a sense of momentum. Because employees, investors, nobody's interested in investing in a company that's not going anywhere. They're interested in investing and getting involved in something that's really making things happen. So again, something for you to think about. There's a lot of emphasis in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of emphasis around the world on pitching, okay? And people think it's all about the pitch. It's not. Oh yeah, you know, pitching and, and being able to clearly articulate what you're doing, your value proposition, why you're better, why there's an opportunity, that's important. But investors will make a large portion of their decision on an investment on the credibility of the company, the founder, the CEO, the management team. So when you think about pitching, think about how you appear, what kind of credibility that you present to an investor. Your credibility matters a lot. Why does it matter a lot? Remember that picture I showed you of the startup that just didn't go from you know, the bottom left to the top right? 
An investor wants to know they're investing with somebody who's going to figure out how to deal with all the twists and turns along the way. And your credibility is an important element in all of that. Frankly, investors need to like you. They need to like your idea too, but they need to like you. They need to believe in you. So, you've done all those things, you've, um, you've raised your capital, and the question is, what are you going to do with the money? Right? You've raised a bunch of money, so what do you do with it? And how do you know that you are making progress? Well, I already told you that money was my favorite word. My next favorite word is leverage. And my third favorite word are milestones. Because okay. milestones tell you how you're doing. They not only tell you how you're doing, but they tell the investors who put money in your company, how are you doing? Okay. So let me tell you what is not a meaningful milestone. Hiring three engineers and moving to a new office is not a milestone that builds value. It's an expense. Okay? It builds no value. It's just spending money. Getting a reference customer, introducing a new product, getting a distribution partner, those are meaningful milestones. Those are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about not only before you raise the money, but after you raise the money. What are you going to deliver on? 30 days from now, 60 days from now, 90 days from now. And guess what? Some of those milestones are going to change. It's okay. You're in a startup. They change. But you've got to have them, you've got to adjust them, and you need to be communicating them to your investors, to your team, because everybody needs to be aligned. You need to be building value. Along the way, you are going to be making a lot of decisions about what do I do, what are the choices that I make as I try and grow my business. And I've had CEOs come to me um, when I was an investor and a board member and say, so what do I do? And the answer is, look at the things and evaluate them on how they build the long-term value of your enterprise. What builds long-term value? Because that's what you want to do. It's not your short-term revenue. It's not, you know, what's a convenient choice. It's the things that build value. Because that's among your many jobs as a founder and CEO of a company. So, I've given you three words that I really love. Now, let me give you an expression. I think it's three words. OSM. Everybody in the room, of course, knows what an OSM is. Raise your hand if you know what an OSM is. Nobody knows what an OSM is? You guys, this is amazing. Nobody knows. Okay, so it's an oh shit moment. Okay? Does that translate well? Everybody know oh shit moment? Okay, so I, it's not a nice word, so I just call it OSM. It's when things don't go right. And guess what? Every company has them. Every company has multiple OSMs. If you've not yet had an OSM, you will. And you will have another one and another one. This is part of being in a startup. And it's the caliber of the management team to figure out when things don't go right, what to do. When I was a young, naive venture capitalist, I would invest money in a company, We'd wire it to the company, and three weeks later, I had to attend my first board meeting. And of course, I always assumed everything was going fine. And of course, I would show up at the first board meeting, and a major customer had gone away, um, an, an employee had quit, a key employee had quit, something had gone wrong. The, the project development schedule had slipped by three months. And I always thought, why is this happening to my company? It's, you know, it's only happening to my company. It happens to every company. So then I got to be a really smart venture capitalist, or, or rather just an old one. Um, and over time I realized, you know, show up at the first board meeting and assume everything was going wrong. 
And that usually was the right assumption. Okay. They're going to happen to you. Be prepared. Figure out how you solve the problem. All right. Now, here's a concept that I say all the time. People nod their head and then promptly ignore me. Do not ignore me. My 15-year-old son can ignore me. You are not allowed to ignore me. Okay? It's easiest to raise money when you don't need it. The number of companies that I run into who say, oh, well, we don't need money now. Um, you know, people want to throw lots of money at me, and I'm not going to even talk to them. So here's a question. Is anybody going to offer you money when you're desperately needed? When you're down to the last, you know, hundred dollars in your bank account? No. People only give you money, offer you lots of money when you don't need it. I'm not suggesting that you necessarily take the money. Because it may, you really may not need it. But at least have that conversation. You need to know what your choices and options are. Because guess what? Nobody will give you money when you really need it. Trust me. It's really, really hard to do it. And companies make that mistake all the time. So at least have that conversation. Be thoughtful about when people offer you money. And the corollary to that is don't run out of money. Right? Because it really, really is tough to keep your team together. It's tough to get credibility with customers. It's tough to raise capital when you're down to the last money that you have. Um, and venture capitalists are greedy. You know, when they smell blood, boy, do they cut a deal. It's not a good place to be for you or for the company. So I started giving a variation on this talk 10 or 15 years ago, and I used to talk about Silicon Valley being a small place, and it really is. It's easy to get connected throughout Silicon Valley. Um, if you do good things, your good reputation spreads. If you do bad things, your bad reputation spreads. Um, I work all over the world now. I, this year I will have gone around the world something like six times. Um, it is a very, very small world. That's a benefit to all of you because it means you can create businesses, you can go into new markets, you can look at opportunities all over the world. But if you don't behave ethically, if you um, do things that uh, people will say not nice things about you, then it's a small world in a very bad sense. And so I would encourage you um, to be honest, to be truthful. Um, it doesn't matter where you are, people will hear about it. Um, so it isn't a journey. Um, the road isn't quite as clear as you would seem. Um, I want you as a startup to drive fast, drive safely. I don't want you to stop when those brick walls come out. Um, I should have. I would have saved my father's car. Uh, I don't want you to crash. And your job is to figure out how to go over the wall, how to go under the wall, how to go around the wall and it will take you on the road to success. Thank you very much.